Yes. Well, anyhow, today we are a bride of faith, and this is a bride, her name is Rebecca. And um, we see how Abraham has, um, uh, is sending for, it's time for his son to get married. <laughs> Imagine, it's time for my daughter to get married. you imagine doing that? <laughs> so anyhow, it's time for Isaac to get married. And um, yes. Uh. Well, uh, so today... The, what's that? Oh, the bride of faith is, uh, of course, the Rebecca, and the the Sunday school lesson. You know, there the introduction and so on talks about how that uh, um, people sometimes think of the Bible as being dull and dreary and so on. But um, we have the uh, romantic story of um, Abraham sending his uh, chief servant to go find his son a bride, and how that the bride that he finds he has. Um, he has uh, some things that he sets out there for her to say and do, and she does, and, you know, she comes back, and it's the, it's the first scene that we, you know, with those, those TV advertisements, we have these two people running through the field, and they jump into each other's arms. Well, that's kind of what's pictured here. So um, before we get there into that uh, final scene uh, of this chapter, we, we begin with... Um, the parallels between what happens with um, Abraham and his son and sending out the servant. And um, so we'll, we'll look at that and we find uh, how that there is demonstration of God's direction and guidance for our lives and how that God can set in motion things in our life that just set other things up. You know, like uh, we put these feelers or these, you know, God, if this happens, I'll know that you want me to do that. If that happens, I'll know that you want me to do this, you know. And being able to put things in a, in a dimension that isn't really possible, you know, unless something of a divine origin shows up. And, and I think of that whenever we um, run into people out of the blue <laughs> and you haven't seen them for a while or Things are not as they should be, and just suddenly a door opens, and it's like, wow. Or we uh, pray for something, and we, when in our heart we know, well, God, um, uh, if, this is, if this is the case, if this is the case, you know, uh, whenever we were here um, about 10 years, uh, and, you know, it was some uh, church headed, you know, and, and spoke about, you know, was feeling maybe we should move and things like that. And I, I, I pray about it and stuff. And I said, well, you know, if somebody calls me and a church calls me and they have this, this, and this, uh, I don't want to go there. So a guy calls me and gets, and I said, what about this, this, and this? He says, yeah, we got all of that. And I said, okay, that's not one. So I scratched that one off. <laughs> and then it was a, a second time. And then finally I just canceled it all out. But what happened was everything that I, in my mind, said, well, if this is the case, you don't want to go there. <laughs> you, don't want to, you don't want to follow that leading. So those, that, was, that was whenever we were here about 10 years. And Rachel, of course, was, uh, I think she was entering high school or junior high. And she said, I'm not moving. I'll move above sheets and stay there. <laughs> so she, she was going to move above sheets. That's whenever sheets was down here in the dentist office and there was apartments above it. She was moving to those apartments because she wasn't leaving Wimber, so. That wasn't part of the prayer, but. Yeah. Yeah, it was in her time, but it's just, it's just, whenever we pray about things, it's like these impressions come into our mind, and it's like, okay. Um, so, anyhow, we have... Um, what is it? The supreme lesson of this chapter is the representation of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in seeking and finding a bride, the church, the son of the father, and then the preparing and the bringing of, 
of the bride of her to uh, be the bride of Isaac. And so we see this as kind of a the coming of the Holy Spirit and leading us to Christ and becoming part of the body of Christ. All right. So the the scripture is in Genesis chapter twenty four, and I thought I would try. Genesis twenty four. Yes. And Abraham was old, and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest. No. I want to stop there. First of all, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. <clears throat> it's one, I think, in our life, when we talk about blessings, we sometimes back off and say, well, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm, you know it's, I'm not worthy, or God doesn't mean that from... God, it's meant for God to bless his children. Okay? So we are to be blessed. Now, what that blessing is, we don't know, but we see here for Abraham that God blessed him in all things. All things. So whenever we're looking at our life, Abraham represents God and God's relationship with us, and you know we are connected with... Um, I'll go back a little bit. Last week, and I'm going to speak about it this week, <clears throat> um, we belong to God, and we come from God, and we belong to God. And we're going to see this, you know, from my perspective. I always understood this in the sense of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the children of Israel and how that the nation of Israel came from God and they belonged to God. Okay? Always, you know, that was never a doubt. You see a Jewish person or, or you know, and I go, well, you know, they belong to God. Well, they don't, may not believe in God, but they belong to him, you know? Well, in our life, we are, we belong to God. And we came from God just as much as the children of Israel, okay? So we're in this relationship with God. And just as the promises were made to Abraham and to Isaac, to Jacob and to the nation of Israel throughout the Old Testament, those same promises apply to us. Now, in the, in the cause of the nation of Israel, we have uh, in the Old Testament, we have how God worked through them as a nation, in the New Testament, we have God working through us as individuals and the bride of Christ. So that's how we can take the promises that are given to a nation and recognize that they transfer to us as individuals. Okay? We came from God, we belong to God, just as much as Abraham. All right? Because we've been bought in, grafted in by the blood of Christ. Okay? So Abraham was blessed in all things. So that's just a little side note there servant of his house that ruled over all that he had put i pray thee thy hand under my thigh and i will make thee swear by the lord the god of heaven and the god of the earth that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the canaanites among whom i dwell but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son isaac okay now so we have the summary of Abraham's life. He's a man well stricken in age, and he doesn't need much of an introduction. But we have there that, he is, that God has blessed him in, in all things. And the, uh, Abraham's testimony was, was incomplete, was inadequate, unless his descendants experienced the same blessing. Now, this is where I think that we as God's children need to pray for our children. That the blessing of God that is on our life is the blessing that is to continue into our children and our children's children. And so whenever we pray for them, remember now, we, we belong to God. Um, we came through God. We came, um, we came through God. We belong to God. So... You may, they may be your children came, came by you, but they came from God, all right? So we came from God and that we belong to God. So, and so when we pray to our, for our children, we pray that anything that is evil, wrong, whatever, we pray that God, God, you know, it's our prayer, and I'm going to do this in church too, that our children belong to you, okay? Devil doesn't have a, have a, doesn't have a claim on them. He doesn't have ownership of them because they already belong to God. Why? Because I gave them to God. And they're my kids and they're not, they're God's kids came, 
Okay, got that? So, verse 2 is a solemn oath. Now, you, you know, this may be, uh, sounds a little crude, <laughs> but in the ancient times, the, uh, and I'll read what it says here so I don't mess it up. Abraham instructs his chief servant to place his hand under his thigh. And the male genital was culturally significant in that day as a symbol of offspring and fruitfulness. A man's honor and the value of his life were based on the natural nature of his offspring. And so, therefore, when the most sacred of oaths were taken, one party would place his hand on or kneel near the genitals of the other. This symbolized the gravity of the situation, for it was the oath, for if the oath were broken, a curse would follow the lineage of the one breaking it. <laughs> so, we have this oath that is taken because of the solemn nature of it, and, and it, it was a, again, a place of um, signifying the, the children, the offspring, and, and how that God would bless through the generations. Now, um, some of the you know Jewish um, faith today, they don't they don't believe in eternal life. You know, like the Sadducees were Sadducees, <laughs> they didn't believe in an afterlife. Uh, and and a number of those in in a, in a Jewish um, synagogue, uh, some of them don't believe in an afterlife. They believe in the life going be extending through your children. And that's why it is so important for them, for them to marry only um, those of the Jewish faith and of a, of a Jewish descent. Now, I remember the rabbi, I was speaking to him about it, and, you know, and he said, well, he doesn't know what his congregation believes. You know, whenever he has a funeral, he has to talk to the, to the family to find out if they believe in an afterlife or not. Because the synagogue does not, at, at that time he was telling me, the synagogue, he does not set that for the individuals. That's up to the individual to determine in their running through the scriptures. So Abraham's oath was with his chief servant and became the normative, the norm for the um, later Jewish community. That will be something um, that the first, it set a precedent of holiness being defined as being consecrated and separated to the Lord. So whenever your children, you, before they were even born, they were consecrated and separated to God. So this was, <laughs> before they were born, before they were conceived, there was this promise that they belonged to God, belonged to God before they were even born. Hmm. Second, uh, the oath set a precedent for Jewish marriage. Uh, for throughout the, the law that was given later, and um, interfaith, um, well, marriages at that time were more than just a, ma a husband and wife. It was clan to clan. It was family to family. So, you know, um, I think sometimes we recognize that, you know, in the uh, uh, medieval times where kings and Queens, they would marry their daughters to from the Queen of England or the, the daughter of an English queen would marry a king from Spain and that would put an alliance between the two nations. You know, so that's basically what was going on here is it wasn't just two men, or two men, <laughs> wasn't two families, <laughs> geez, wasn't two families <laughs> marrying uh, a man and a woman marrying, it was two families being joined together. And... Um, they belong to God. The third uh, example is remained a uh, template for Israel. Um, even in the second settlement, whenever the children of Israel returned from Babylon, they came back and the first thing they did was to establish their lineage. So, so lineage was everything. Genesis 2, verses 5 through 9. Let's see if I can follow this one. Okay. Yeah, excuse me, 24. Okay. Oh, it went. All right, so it went away. <laughs> so anyhow, we have here in uh, verses 5 through 9 of Genesis 24, 
the servant, um, perhaps, you know, um, he is taken back by the intense charge that has given to him that he's, you know, he's got to take on this duty and it's his responsibility to find a wife for his master's son. And I mean, this is, I mean, this is a gra- very grave responsibility because if he doesn't do it, his, all of his genealogy is going to be cursed. <laughs> all right, so, you know, go find my, my son a wife and if you don't do it, you know, all your family is going to be cursed from now on. Okay, wait a minute, we got to put some parameters on this. So, what's that? Send somebody else. That sounds like us. God, oh, I want to bless you through all generations. Oh, you know, I don't think that's good enough. But anyhow, Abraham was blunt. His son uh, should not set foot in Haran. He was Abraham's son, Isaac, was not to go back to where he came from. He, you know, that was not his home, and his bride was not to come from there. So um, we have... Um, I can't read. So the covenant that God had made with Abraham was that he was uh, coming out of there. It was the oath that he had taken that God would establish him um, in, the new, in his new land, in the promised land. Now verse 10. And the servant took 10 camels. Um, oh, and he also says that somewhere in there, oh, he says that um, if... If, I, if you can't find it and it doesn't work out and, you know, nobody, the woman that, you know, they won't come, well, then the, you're released from that, you know, that vow. So the servant made sure that was in place. So verse 10, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor, And he made his camel to kneel down uh, without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even at the time that women go out to draw water. So you know it's woman's work to get water, okay? Just wanted you to know that. It says it right there in the Bible. (laughs) You uh, You know, it's a man's responsibility to make coffee. You know that one, right? Yeah, Hebrews. (laughs) <laughs> so. <laughs> so anyhow um, so the, the servant understands that the entire covenant between God and Abraham rested on his shoulders now if we understand the covenant God has made that God has sent the Holy Spirit and everything that God represents is in the is the holy is in the, is is the holy spirit and he brings that to us okay so he, he has that response as it is the per, the person of the holy spirit has the responsibility of bringing to of teaching us you know leading us into all truth and that the blessing of god and the favor of god just as it was with the the master the servant so it is with us by the holy spirit given to us so if Isaac was forced to take a wife from the can- clans of the Canaan, uh, the promise of Abram's offspring growing into a consecrated nation was virtually canceled out because there would be the intermarriage and the, the gods of the Canaanites and so on would become their gods and it wouldn't, you know, he didn't want that to happen. So, providentially, I like that word, providentially, providentially, um, Providence would have it <laughs> that the servant arrived in the evening time at the well and that was the time that women were coming out to gather water. So what's he there for? He's there to find a bride for his, his master's son and he arrives in the evening time and he just providentially shows up at this particular time. So, and he said, so he's setting the stage. All right, now I'm here. I'm where I'm supposed to be. Now God... If, this is what we have in the next scripture, I pray that you would send to me someone that when I ask them to draw me water, they will draw water and they will also draw water for my camels. Okay? So you set that in motion. Before it ever happens, I'm here now and I want to set this up. So this way he said, And he said, O Lord, my, 
God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Good speed, I've just arrived. Let me find the wife for my, uh, my master's son and let me head back home quickly. <laughs> so behold, I stand here at the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be, sh be she that thou hast appointed for my servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. <laughs> so, he set the stage. <laughs> Some, you know, do we, do we need a sign, you know? <laughs> Anybody ever pray for a sign? And I always think, of, I know I've said this before, but there's a cartoon that, first cartoon is, God, send me a sign. Send me a sign. And the next, next cartoon, the thing, there's this big sign that has fallen out of heaven and crashes in front of the guy, and it's there and it says, here's your sign. <laughs> so in our life, often we're saying, give me a sign, give me a sign. Well, duck, <laughs> there's a sign coming. Well, this is what... Um, this is what the, the, the master, or excuse me, the servant made this declaration. I need a sign. You know, something that will distinguish one person from another. So, in our life, it's not wrong to ask. It's not wrong, ask, seek, knock. It's not wrong to put things out there. But <laughs> once God has answered your prayer, then you say, well, how about we do this one? Because <laughs> yeah, sometimes we're not always willing I need another sign. That was too easy. <laughs> uh, so the servant wanted things clear cut and, 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 um, and be, un, un, well, anyhow, he wanted them black and white and ambiguous. He didn't want it to be ambiguous. He wanted to be, well, whatever, un, unambiguous. That is a word. It's right here in my commentary. Unambiguous. So we will not always receive a sign. We can pray for specific help, but it doesn't say God. It's all right to ask for a sign. All right, anyhow, verse, 20, verse 15. And it came to pass before he had been done speaking. Kaboom, okay. God, I want it to be this way. And before he finished speaking, he looked up and behold, Rebecca came out. Wow, now there's a good looking woman. <laughs> she was very beautiful. Um, who was born to Beth Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. So this is Abraham's brother's daughter. Okay? So it wasn't wrong in those days to marry your cousin. But she is. But unless she's in West Virginia. <laughs> I won't go there. But anyhow... <laughs> Well, I have, I have relatives that married their cousins. But we won't go there either. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, my mother used to always get upset. No, not upset. What happened, Rachel and her cousin, Bob McGee, they would always tell my mother that they were going to get married. And she would just, oh, you can't do that. You can't. Do that. <laughs> she would go into this big 10 minute dissertation, you know. And they'd do this every month or two. They'd go and tell her, you know. So they just would pull her chain and she jumped for it. Okay, so Rebecca came out and born. And so, and so this is Abraham's brother's daughter with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And when she had done, when she had done giving him a drink, this, you know, there's the skipping, skipping a few verses here, 16 through 18. So he asked for the water. He, you know, she gave him went to the well and brought out water and he drank the water. And when he was done drinking, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have been done drinking. <laughs> now, we would think that that's um, not a bad thing, you know, draw water for a camel. So I looked it up and one site said a camel can drink 53 gallons of water in three minutes. Another site says 30 gallons in less than 15 minutes. So if you have a pitcher of maybe, you don't think it would be five-gallon jug, 
so you have a couple gallon pitcher that you are drawing water out of a, out of a well, you got some work ahead of you. And so to volunteer to, to do this was a true sign <laughs> that uh, not many people are going to sign up for this duty, especially to a stranger who is, you know, and everybody, you, can, you know he's a stranger, and strangers in that time were not welcome because they could be spies. So you have all this stuff going on, and you have uh, Rebecca, you know, saying, you know, I'll give you a drink, and I'll, I'll, I'll water your camels also. Exactly as the master had stated. You know, the servant had stated in his prayer to God. So, um, in response to this reevaluation, he withdrew. And once she did all of this, he withdrew costly gold jewelry from his supplies and presented the pieces to her. So he got he started pulling out all of this gold and silver that he had brought with him, all this wealth, and he says, here, put this on, here, wear this, and here, give, you know, here's this stuff, you know, who is this guy? And, and, and Rebecca is probably, she, well, <clears throat> she's probably 13, 15 years old, you know, um, because when um, a, a, a woman was able to have children, that's generally whenever they were given to be married. So she's somewhere in that, you know, 13, 14, 15-year-old age group. And here comes this guy. You know, she goes out of her way to water his camels and give him a drink. And then the next thing you know, she's lavished with all of these jewels. And it was the last time I think she ever had to draw water. <laughs> because she is now going to be the wife of, a, of Abraham's son, who has been blessed by God in all things. So he's very, Abraham is very wealthy. And he brings a portion of that wealth with him to, as a dowry for the daughter and for uh, Rebecca to let her know that uh, she's not just heading off to a far country. She's going to meet a very wealthy individual who's done very well for himself. So... Um, Well, I think God knows the desires of her hearts, and she would have been a person whose heart was in the right place. And, um, you know, so I, I think that that's um, part of, like, our lives, that whenever, if our heart is in the right place, God is going to present the opportunities. You know, she's not pray maybe she is secretly praying for her husband, but the... the um, the, mass, the, the servant is specifically praying to find someone exactly like this, you know, that matches his requirements and his, you know, matches his prayer specifically. She is just doing good things and good deeds because it's part of who she is as a person. So on both sides, we have how that we can pray for things and also we can also be the person who's doing the right things for the right reasons and be blessed for it. So we got to be willing to, you got to be willing to, you got to be a Rebecca who is willing to do the extra, go the extra mile, but you've got to be a Rebecca who is willing to receive the blessing. Because she did wear the jewelry home. <laughs> All right. Uh, verse uh, 57. Well, anyhow, she goes to her parents. You know, he, he, you know, she invites him to come home and meet the family and, and do all that. And um, the, they come to find out, you know, the, the servant doesn't know that this, Ab this is Abraham's brother's daughter, okay? He doesn't know that when he picks her out of this woman coming out the gate. So their family, joining clans then is not a big, I mean, it, it is a big deal, but it's, part of the same clan, you know? So it's, it's a good thing that, you know, Abraham's brother is now, his daughter is now going to marry Abraham's son. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a, great, an arrange, that's a great arrangement in marriage. 
And they said, verse 57, uh, so Abra uh, the servant then presents all this stuff, you know, the dowry to, to Abraham's brothers, uh, you know, to their household. This is the dowry that we have brought, all the gold and the silver and all this we've brought here for, for you for this dowry. And he said, we need to start back immediately. And they want her to stay 10 more days, 10 more days with our daughter. And the um, servant says, nope, we're leaving tomorrow. Then they said, and they said, we will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. We'll see what she wants to do. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. You know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. So God knocks at our house, our heart's door, and we say, yes, I will. I'll receive. So whenever we see how the God is coming to us, now we can, we are, we are sometimes we're the, the, uh, the servant looking, and sometimes we are Rebecca accepting, I will go. And they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. And let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate you. It's interesting that she literally is the mother of thousands of millions. You see, whenever it talks about us blessing, to bless, pray for blessing upon ourselves, blessing upon our kids, you know, blessing upon our families, that just isn't words falling off our, our lips. It can be the inspiration of the Holy Spirit telling us, this is what I'm going to do with your family. This is what I'm going to bring into your family. This is what I'm going to do through you. Oh, they're just bad weeds. <laughs> no. They are growing children, <laughs> learning, <laughs> learning and growing and becoming. And so we have here that she is the mother of thousands of millions. And let thy seed possess the gates of those which hate them. You know, when I say we belong to God, we come from God, we belong to God, that our enemies are already defeated. And it says in a blessing that comes upon um, Rebecca is thy seed possess the gates of those which hate you. So anyone who is against you, don't worry about it. God's going to take care of it. And verse 61, and Rebecca arose and her damsel and they rode upon the camels and followed the man and the servant took Rebecca and went his way. They followed the man and he represents the Holy Spirit in some, you know, as we've been going through this. So we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. God comes with his blessings and comes with, his off comes with all of that he offers to us, freedom of, salva freedom of, uh, uh, of salvation, forgiveness of sins, eternal life and the promises of God, and we follow the Holy Spirit. And um, we jump to verse 64, and often, perhaps, I was thinking, it says in, that the servant is telling Rebecca about what a great man she's going to marry. I'm sure she's not there saying, well, you know, you really got hooked on this one. <laughs> He's telling her, you've got it made. This guy is wonderful. He is, he's, you know, he's just a great person and on and on and on about Abraham and Isaac and what he is and all of this. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the candle, <laughs> lighted off the camel, <laughs> She jumps off the camel in the field to, uh, in the camel, for she had said unto the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, it is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. So she took her veil, put it over her head, and they are running through the field and dun, 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 dun. dun. Love story. <laughs> Isaac and Rebecca are married, and so we go on to next week's lesson. <laughs> so, um, what else? Anything else here? So, and it also finishes up that, you know, it didn't quite 
Uh, Isaac, Isaac misses his mother, okay? The guy, the guy is Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and his mother. Now, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah would have had Isaac when she's 100, or when she's 90. Do you think she would have doted over her child? <laughs> so this was, his, he was everything to her. And so that was kind of a, a missing part of, of Isaac's life. And whenever he found his bride, she, it says in the scripture that she filled that void of what was missing with the death of his mother. So it isn't that uh, Rebecca becomes his mother, but that the void that was there, um, she filled with her love for him. So that's the story of the servant who represents the Holy Spirit, uh, searching out under divine covenant, under the covenant agreement that he made with Abraham, to find the bride, which is you and I. We are the bride of Christ. And the Holy Spirit, you did not find me, the Bible says, but you did not choose me, I chose you. God found us and called us. You know, he saw us walking out. To, well, there goes a beautiful woman. There goes a handsome man. That's the one I want. And then we're led by the Holy Spirit to where God by to where God wants us to be, who God wants us to be. And the whole time, the Holy Spirit is telling us about our Master, about our God, and we have it all written down. But He's helping us to understand that as the servant talk to Rebecca about Abraham and about Isaac. The, the Holy Spirit talks to us about God, our relationship with Jesus Christ, and everything he is to us and all the promises that belong to us because we belong to him. Everything that belonged to Abraham and to Isaac is now Rebecca's. I will go. I will. <laughs> God, I will. I will follow you. Amen? Father, we are grateful. We belong to you. We come from you. And Lord, that you have a, a purpose for our life and all the situations that, uh, that we come into, that we encounter. We know, Lord, that you will bless and guide and give strength to our lives each day. So, Bless, our, bless your word to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That is the story. Yeah, ongoing. <laughs>